justice systems and the head of the panel, uh, Eaton, and I, Eaton, I never, I always get the first name right, but the last name I fumble with. Well, it's actually Aton. Aton, I get the first name wrong too. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and Rebecca Turner are here um, from the panel on racial disparities in the justice system. And you have uh, filed your report and it's on our website, uh, the committee webpage, the report is. That's and right now I'm, I'm actually looking at Appendix I, which are basically your, um, where you think we should be prioritizing. Um, but committee members, um, we can follow it there. If you'd rather, um, we can have Phil try to post it um, right here on the webpage. I don't know what people prefer. I've got on the device. Okay, well, please go right ahead um, with, the, with your report. Ah, okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I thought that what would be useful was giving you some background and then going through just sort of an overview of what the panel did with this particular document. Um, we, it, uh, of before, course, I like just want to, as way of introduction, Representative Grad and I are going to invite you to, assuming I'm chair of judiciary again, assuming she's chair of judiciary again, in the new legislative biennium, uh, we would like to have a joint meeting of both committees with you as well. Great. Okay. Please go ahead. This all went back, as has everything in 2020, to the pandemic. Um, originally, I believe this bill was S338. Um, it's hard for me to remember all the numbers, just like all the acronyms, I get lost. Um, and that this became then Act 148. And I, we were told, I was told before the pandemic that this was a shoe in and then when the pandemic struck, I was told that nothing that was not pandemic related would go through. Um, I live down in Putney, I'm not a legislator. And so I have informants <laughs> who run around <laughs> the state house. And every so often I get a phone call and email going, oh, you really need to worry about this in regard to the RDAP, which I am very grateful for because otherwise nothing would happen if I were the chair. Um, so this summer in a very serendipitous moment that I did not expect, I was suddenly informed that the bill had gone through, was signed and was now Act 148. And I mean, I, I literally did not know. Someone said, asked me in a meeting that I didn't think was about this. And so what is the RDAP doing about Act 148? And I literally said, what would that be? And I guess nothing. Um, but that changed relatively quickly because it became clear that the RDAP had responsibilities in regard to this new act. Um, and specifically in section 19, which directed the panel to consider data that could be used for the amelioration of racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice systems. Before this task fell to us, we were as a panel looking to amplify many of the points that we had made in our report that we submitted to this body, in fact, almost exactly a year ago, um, that really asked us, in fact, predominantly um, initially to focus on data. Um, and there was a feeling on the part of the panel at this point this year that there should be a deeper dive um, in regard to a lot of the recommendations that we made in that document. Uh, and we were at that point, uh, and this is, oh, I don't know, late June or so, we're starting to turn our attention to this, this proposed deeper dive. When we looked at Act 148, of course, it, Section 19 asks us to consider data again. And for us, this was a reconsideration of data. Um, given that we had spoken and had been directed by statute to speak very directly about data in Act 54 of 2017. Um, so this really wasn't a stretch and it wasn't completely out of what we were hoping to do. 
the time frame was quite a reach, I have to say. Um, doing it by the 1st of December, when we were told about it in early summer was, was a bit difficult and we weren't sure that it was possible. And we spent a great deal of time discussing what could and could not realistically be done. I'm happy to say I'm really pleased with the result. I think people did an enormous lift on this. The entire panel did um, put in a lot of extra time. We meet two hours a month um, and five members of the 13 are community members. So it's really quite difficult in some ways to get this kind of work done. And yet we did. Um, there was some initial feeling that we were repeating ourselves and some irritation about this. Um, endless reports are something that tend to annoy people of color um, who would like to see more motion and a, perhaps a bit less verbiage. Um, but we did our, turn our attentions to producing whatever it was that we could produce in what was then roughly 10 hours of meeting time with the full panel. Um, and I'm spreading that out over around five months. Uh, the lack of time meant that we convened a subcommittee to do a great deal of the heavy lifting. People who were particularly concerned about this and who felt that they had the extra time. We were meeting weekly, um, sometimes a little more than that. Um, we did that with the assistance and the support of the Council of State Governments, and also quite notably with the tremendous assistance of the Crime Research Group, which was statutorily required to help with the data collection that this new report would necessitate. And as I say, that group met weekly, and we were also on the phone innumerable times between the weeks. Um, initially, even a smaller group of these of this subcommittee met with Kristen McClure, the head of the Agency of Digital Services, um, without whose help, frankly, this document would not exist. That smaller group met with also a collection of IT officials from various state agencies to get a sense of several things. First, what data do exist at this moment? In what form they exist? And three, the possibilities of communication between the various data systems that exist in the criminal and juvenile justice systems. The result of those meetings, and I believe that there were two of them, that's my memory. Um, I should ask James Pepper about that. He was central to those. They are, the, the results of those are contained within appendix four of what you have. Um, it's entitled The Current State of Data and data flows regarding racially relevant data among various state agencies in Vermont. If you have that particular appendix up with that chart, you'll note uh, this was created by Kristen McClure and it's really quite suitable for framing, I think. Um, but it more importantly shows the unbelievably tangled web that are the data flows regarding racially relevant data among various agencies. It is crazy. <laughs> I, I use that word in the technical sense. It is crazy. Um, when we began this meeting, Kristen started out with a very, very clean document. And as people would speak, she draw another line. And I remember start at, at about 45 minutes into this, I started in with a migraine and I thought I was getting an ocular one and realized I wasn't. It was just all the lines she was drawing. Um, a lot of the data don't exist. There are very peculiar systems that conflate race and ethnicity, which as an anthropologist made me cringe um, no one should ever make that mistake, by the way. Um, and as the report notes, this is a snapshot of a state of affairs from September, and it cannot be said to depict matters as they presently stand, because several agencies were in the process of changing data systems over, even as we were speaking, and are still in that process now, from what I understand. Um, they are getting better, from what I'm told. Um, they're changing not necessarily because of the need for cross-agency communication, but rather because of internal needs that the agencies themselves have. So it won't help to assume for the purposes of this act, Act 148, 
that the data flows are more comprehensible or indeed usable. Um, the subcommittee commit continued its work from this point of looking at this chart that just gave me a migraine. Um, what do we do? That would be the huge question here. It seemed to the subcommittee and to the full panel that without some sort of standardization, which by the way is a point that the RDAP addressed in its report of December of last year, um, that this would be another failed effort concerning the effacement of racial disparity, that standardization is truly central to this effort. This had been and continues to be a dominant theme for the panel as the current report makes quite clear. Without some serious and focused standardization regarding data, the aims of Act 148 with reference to data cannot be achieved. That cannot be overstated. Um, this was perhaps a guiding notion that shaped the panel's efforts throughout the summer and fall as it prepared the present document. Another important moment that concerned the panel had to do with identifying high impact, high discretion moments in the criminal and juvenile justice systems at which either conscious or unconscious bias can make an entrance. This was a task that had occupied our collective imagination in last year's report, and, but we certainly did not take it as far then as we have here. Um, all of the lawyers that are on the panel put their heads together to make an extremely comprehensive list of these high impact, high discretion moments. And you have those tables in the report, in the body of the report. And this took no a small amount of time, as you can imagine. As I say, we tried to do this for last year's report and for whatever reason, couldn't quite pull it off. We did here. Um, and the community members were able to add other moments that might seem to be outside of the legal framework. Moments such as interactions between students, students of color and guidance counselors in the school, which for many people are, is the beginning of the school to prison pipeline. Um, it's easy now, of course, to give you a resume of these acts. And I really do have to note the enormous amount of time it took to compile these lists. Um, and I'm very glad that Rebecca Turner's here because <laughs> she was really central to a lot of this. Um, it seemed endless and people dedicated enormous amounts of time and energy to this compilation. What happened at the same time was the compilation of the data that do presently exist. And with the help of the crime research group, we created a sense of where those data might reside. Uh, the crime research group also worked to give us a sense of what data just don't exist. And that's in fact uh, something you're gonna need to look at because there are places within the system that the data just isn't there. Um, and once the panel determined what data would nevertheless be of great importance, crime research group went back and filled in on our tables, what was there, what was not there, and so on. Again, it was a focus upon the high impact, high discretion moments, sentencing, charging, arraignment, you know, those, I mean, I, that's just to mention three, you know what I mean. In the end, the panel came up with a compilation, not merely of those data, but their locations as a result of working on the creation of this report we joked actually about printing these documents out and then burying them in a kind of time capsule that was secure somewhere up on Camel's Hump because it had taken so much to get this together and we were like, oh my God, it's all in one place for a moment here. Um, what subsequently became clear were the relatively high number of high impact, high discretion moments in the criminal and juvenile justice systems. We were also mindful of what might be perceived as the relative impossibility of getting to all of these moments in one fell swoop. We then set our minds to prioritizing these moments to the best of our abilities. And that was a difficult chat task. Um, you're saying at certain moments in a way, at certain moments in a way, racial disparity doesn't matter. And that's a very hard thing to, to say, because um, it's not true. 
it's just a question of prioritizing. Where should our efforts initially be focused? Um, we deeply believe that all of the moments are of great concern and need focus and attention, but we show the moments that we believe to have the greatest priority and what data do and do not exist concerning those moments. At this point, we had a spread of the high impact, high discretion moments and racially relevant data or lack thereof. And the question became what to do with this um, kind of mess in a way. <laughs> um, it seemed clear to many of us that there was no one presently in state government who could on their own do the huge, and I mean really truly enormous, once you look at this, I think you'll get a sense of the enormity of what I'm talking about. There was no one who on their own could do the huge lift that was required here, not only to just create the needed data, but even more fundamentally and radically to define it, right? To define the data, then to gather it, and certainly then to analyze it. Given that much there is data that simply doesn't exist, or we're not sure where it is, or it's not easily available at this point. And there were moments in this where people just couldn't find things even after spending two or three weeks working at it. Um, from the early meetings with Kristen McClure and those IT officials, it really became clear that no one actually has the time to do all of this. Again, I'd say refer to that lovely flow chart on uh, page 24, that, that uh, that's the one that gave me a headache. The Council of State Governments came to our rescue, or at least to mine at that point, because I was a little overwhelmed and losing sleep. Um, this work, it turns out, is already underway in Connecticut, quite nearby. And also, I believe, and Rebecca can correct me on this, I believe also in Colorado, I was reading, um, and the Council of State Government people um, facilitated a meeting between the panel and three officials from the state of Connecticut's Criminal Justice Policy and Planning Division in the Office of Policy and Management. These people are involved in the implementation of that state's own efforts regarding the collection and analysis of data concerning the effacement of racial disparities in the two systems, criminal justice systems. The panel had a very productive meeting with these three officials. I believe it was on the 3rd of November um, and they offered rather useful insight. And the panel felt that their input gained from actual experience in exactly the process that we're being asked to consider would be invaluable. And we met with Mark Pelka this is in the report. He is the Undersecretary of Connecticut's Criminal Justice Policy and Planning Division in the Office of Policy and Management. And two of his colleagues, Kyle Bodwin and Kevin Neary, who are planning analysts with whom he works. Um, that meeting led to several additional recommendations from the panel to the legislature. Um, we felt that building upon their experience would be useful and that there was no need to reinvent the wheel, especially since the movement on the matter of disparity is really so pressing. Um, and you have those recommendations there and they're pretty, they're, they're, it's a big lift. That a body be charged with the definition, collection and analysis of data pertaining to racial disparities. Um, and Connecticut has shown as those individuals with whom we met would, would demonstrate that they needed three staff people to do that work. Also bear in mind Connecticut in terms of population is rather a great deal larger than um, Vermont. Uh, that this body is housed in an entity to the, that is not subject to the vagaries of the political process, nor in any entity that is politically constituted. Um, disparities we really felt must not be seen as a partisan issue and there must be no opportunity for them to be so seen. Um, that funding be provided for positions within state agencies that need, those, that need to extract the data concerning racial disparity um, and that that would be provided to this new body. 
that extraction is both time consuming and possibly quite lengthy. We were also hoping that as Connecticut does, that this body would produce timely reports. They, use, they do things monthly that are distinctly and deliberately aimed at the legislature and also at broader communities, including historically impacted communities um, pertaining to racial disparities in both justice systems that are concerned certainly with basic demographic information. Transparency, we felt, must be prime in the reports. We also felt that there should be an advisory body that, the, and Connecticut has this, of course, um, consisting of stakeholders from historically impacted communities, BIPOC communities, neurodivergent communities, communities of gender and sexual minorities, and that that body would concern itself with definition of data because it's not always clear what those data should be. An example of that would be what I mentioned earlier, this notion that somehow um, race and ethnicity in certain systems can be combined. Um, I cannot tell you how horrifying I find that. It's just, I mean, I would either be a Jew or black. I'm both. <laughs> um, and then finally, that the legislature both expect to create this body and further be prepared to consider legislation that supports its work as its needs change over time. I'd finally just like to put a little postscriptum in here about funding, because I know that that always makes everyone's eyes cross. And I did a little bit of research because that's kind of what I do in life is research. And I want to point out how much disparity, the maintenance of disparity cost. And I want to point it out in the middle of the 19th century. And I want to start by noting that in today's dollars, a very common salary, and this was for a laborer in the South in 1850, was $6 a week, which comes to what? $312 for a year. Slaves themselves cost, depending on whether you're, the, what source you're looking at, between $23,000 and $40,000 a piece. Many plantations had 50 or fewer slaves, but even at the low figure, 10 slaves means $230,000, or the annual income of just under 767 free laborers. 50 would mean $1.15 million dollars in today's money. Now, slave ships that came out of Bristol cost 62,000 pounds, roughly 83,000. And again, the annual salary of 277 people in the United States. None of this addresses the cost of feeding slaves, feeding the slavers, maintaining the ships, which of course had to be cleaned and refitted after the transport of slaves to transport goods such as cotton or sugar to Europe, as was part of the triangle trade. The point that I want to make here is the outlay of capital. It is huge, absolutely phenomenally huge. The dedication of capital to an economic system in which white supremacy played a central role. Sadly, the resonances of this system are still with us today and are not anachronistic. These are huge sums of money that have gone into the perpetuation of racial discrimination. And one can profitably ask what it costs to support the repressive efforts that went into Reconstruction and Jim Crow. None of this is ever free. To undo this is also not going to be free. It's not simply a matter, as we all know, of not buying slaves or slave ships. If it were, there'd be no need for this report or this hearing or anything that we're doing. Um, what there does need to be, as this body recognized when it authored Act 148, is a move toward understanding through data personal impacts of white supremacy and racial disparity upon people in our own systems of justice. But this is going to involve an outlay of capital, just as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 did. And it continues to do. 
There are constant arguments involving, and you can find all sorts of legal arguments, uh, articles about the um, extent to which employers can legally justify discriminatory practices on the basis of cost containment and profit maximization, right? And put another way, um, what kind of costs can courts ask businesses to sustain in the effort to enforce equal opportunity? And that happens all the time. So there's obviously a cost to undoing this. What I'm trying to say here is that to say that there's no money may be two things at once. It may certainly be true, but it also supports the very system that this body seeks to interrogate and to dismantle. It becomes a question of an extremely hard and likely intensely creative and probably unprecedented decision. But I do want to make very clear that when we say that there's no money, we're actually making an ideological statement when we're discussing the dismantling of systems of oppression. There's no money means that the money's being used elsewhere and that choices are being made about the dispersal of capital, just as they've always been. If that seems reasonable, if saying that there's no money seems reasonable, I'm asking all of us to consider why that's so and how that's so. And I'm asserting that none of this, none of this effort, nothing that's in this report is going to come for free, just as slave ships and indeed the slaves themselves cost the ruling establishment money in the first place. And I'm done. Thank you. Um, Valerio has to leave, and so I want to thank him um, for, all, for everything this uh, year in justice oversight and, and all his efforts. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. I wonder, uh, I'm sure there's questions, but holding on to them until Rebecca has an opportunity to um, uh, make a comment if she would like. Thank you, Senator Sears. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll try to be brief. I understand uh, we have maybe 15 more minutes. I want to make sure that there are, is a chance. Well, we, can, we can go to 1130 if we have. Okay, great, great. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Rebecca Turner, head of the Appellate Division uh, Defender General's Office and the Defender General's designee on this panel. And so I'm here in my capacity as a member of this panel. Um, Eitan asked me to join him and I appreciate the invite and also appreciate hearing Senator Sears that the intent is to have the panel or Eitan come back uh, and to talk with the Judiciary, Judiciary Committees more about this report. Uh, and. And as a part of that team that pulled together this report, I have to say that I'm, I'm happy to have this uh, report filed uh, with you. Uh, it is extraordinarily satisfying to have pulled together sort of what I see a tangible amount of information on how you could draft, legislate, and pass and move forward a, a comprehensive data collection analysis uh, system for the criminal juvenile justice uh, systems that I think would be, would have profound impact um, here. And, and I wanted to just start with, with where Eitan sort of mentioned, which was the process of this, uh, this report led to us pulling uh, various studies, um, data analyses out of the closets and what we realized was that while we are all well aware of the national pervasive problem of disparities, right? What we didn't realize was how much we had in various different uh, capacities uh, come up with our own snapshots, data analysis of racial uh, disparities in our criminal juvenile systems. Uh, you know, we, we are well aware of the um, traffic stop data that we now know based on the legislation that was passed and that's been fantastic to see that uh, snapshot as to traffic stops. Uh, we got uh, Burlington Police Department shared with us um, 
some bail data that they were collecting out of the Chittenden courts between 2017, 2019. Again, just a snapshot in time of one court uh, where their data tracking showed disparities in bail being imposed based on race and gender, but race for these purposes, as well as who was, who was being uh, granted bail, as well as disparities in the amount of bail. And that was, again, one snapshot uh, there. We also came across um, the recent reporting from, again, Burlington Police Department in terms of racial disparities in arrests uh, in 2019. And I think that data showed um, that black people were being arrested at a rate of about 3.7 times that of white people in Burlington. Um, so just our, 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 our quick look, trying to pull together, we were seeing the disparities in our known data analyses. Uh, and so the exercise that the panel and the subcommittee went through was, well, what, what is going on that results in these disparities? What decision-making points along the way from when a case enters a system, whether it's <clears throat> the juvenile delinquency system or the criminal justice, what decisions are involved? And we went about identifying all of those decisions. And as you pointed out, it's captured in appendix two, appendix one, where we have two different charts and we just wanted to identify every possible point. So the initial encounter that brings someone into the system to when they exit uh, later down the round to the, who is, who's getting the dispositions expunged, right? So we were trying to be extraordinarily comprehensive. Um, and in that we were trying to understand, well, why is it useful to identify these decisions? And, and implicitly we're recognized that there are values-based judgments that are being made at these decisions. Um, and that discretionary decision-making points is happening everywhere, not just at the point of stopping a vehicle, not just at the point of making the initial charges, but it was extraordinary in terms of, you know, who's getting, who's getting diverted to uh, pre-charge or post-charge diversion programs, who's getting accepted, who is finishing them, who's having to, to move around, all of this missing data as to giving us a, a, bit, a full picture of what's going on. How do pre-trial decisions impact upon ultimate sentencing dispositions later on, right? And so one of our questions we had is how do these decisions um, compound effect of racism um, as a particular case, as a person moves through the system. And we wondered, uh, you know, does less discretion, sure. will that show that that results in less disparities? Does more transparency and accountability uh, result in less disparities? Of course, we don't know. But this is, was the the process of identifying these decisions illuminated the potential of what we could stand to learn. Right, um, and really, what we what we are trying to stand to learn is understanding what it actually means when we say systemic racism, when we say institutional racism. Uh, where are these uh, decisions happening at an individual level? But where are they being tolerated? Because once they come into the system, why isn't it being corrected by the subsequent decision makers? Um, and so. That it is our beginning in terms of addressing and identifying those decision making points. I think one of the things that we learned specifically talking with the Connecticut folks in their sharing of their process, both in developing the draft legislation, getting that legislation passed, and now they're one year out of implementing that legislation. So they're starting to get the data and they're starting to report back what they're finding. What was fascinating to hear from them was they're identifying benefits, such tangible benefits right away from the data that they were collecting. Uh, you, the data was informing you know, policy decision uh, making in terms of which, um, where were the needs greatest, right? Which programs were people being diverted to more and less? Right, where was there a need? Uh, and so that was interesting. Um, 
essentially provided performance metrics to, to give insight into uh, whether these programs are working, whether uh, recidivism rates uh, were happening here or there. Uh, and they talked about projecting correctional population forecasts as well. Um, so they also talked about how you can better understand um, and manage, hopefully, better your case flow, where cases are getting stuck and sitting, right? Um, and understanding where to devote resources to get things moving. Um, Again, the obvious benefit was seeing where there were trends and patterns um, between blacks and whites. Uh, and specifically, they looked at trends with the original charges that black and white defendants faced and what were the ultimate dispositions at the end. Uh, so a lot of interesting different layers to look at how the disparities came about, not just the ultimate sentence and was there a difference between similarly situated defendants, but really seeing how, how the disparities played out um, in different ways. So you have a pretty comprehensive list. And we, so we thought it would be useful for the legislature to see what we thought could be a pri prioritization of data collection areas. And in that regard, you can see it in, as highlighted in the appendix, but as a theme, it's, it's, it's basically decision-making points that are front-loaded oh. pre-trial. Um, again, because we thought that that would be, having, having that information have the greatest impact in terms of, of getting ahead of it before the compounding effect of the decisions um, kind of took a case away from correcting it as easily. In, um, and Aitan also uh, talked about this, but I just wanted to stress another uh, great thing that we discovered through this process of preparing for this report was that how much we're not starting from ground zero, right? We had CRG, of course, providing support and in the appendix to, I just wanna make sure that you see there where we identified decision-making points that should be collected, CRG provided a second column there to say what data was already available on those decision-making points and it's what data CSG, wasn't. By the way. CSG? Yeah. But I think, Aton, will Is you it, correct me? No, Is, are, we, are we a different group? No, no, you're right. See, it was confusing because we had both CSG yeah. and CRG. Right. Yeah, but, um, but, and I think this part, but Aton, I want to make sure we give credit to CRG. Was it that CR was CRG? That was CRG. Oh, that was okay. Robin Joy in particular. Who yes. Okay. Who, yeah. So All once right. we identified the decision making points we thought should be collected, she and and, and there may be some other helpers of hers there may there, be others. Uh, yeah. <laughs> who went to the different okay. you know organizations and All asked, right. is that so but what's what's useful there is that it's a reveal that we don't have to it's it's data already there. Right, and what we realize is that there's a lot of siloed data that just isn't being connected, that isn't just isn't being shared, and so that was illuminating. So again, not starting from ground zero, but we have this data available. Uh, another, another, um, another fun thing to have discovered through this process was the National Center on Restorative Justice. Uh, the National Center on Restorative Justice is. Um, an organization that was established just this year in April, one of the um, bright spots of 2020. And if, if you're not familiar with the center yet, um, it's something that should be on your list. It's, it's an organization, it's actually three academic institutions, Vermont Law School, University of, of Vermont, and the University of San Diego, uh, have come together and formed this National Center on Restorative Justice that is being hosted by VLS. And uh, they received a fantastic grant from USDOJ for the next uh, few years. And they came to talk to us about what they're doing. Again, talking about sort of the, um, thinking about what, what resources are available in state um, to build and improve upon uh, the capacity to, to undertake this kind of project. And what they shared with us is that they have 
you know, their, their principle and their focus is on um, improving the criminal justice system and policies in the United States. And they're doing this partly through education, but there is also um, a research uh, arm, uh, research and data arm of this project. And that is particularly being handled by the UVM's uh, Justice Research Initiative. And so they came and talked to us and we learned that not only is this, this organization just newly up, but it's building upon what UVM's uh, Justice Research Initiative has, has already been working on. And they've been looking at data, Vermont uh, criminal justice data as well. And so it was interesting and, and useful to hear from them that they're, they're prioritizing um, ahead work that will hopefully address disparities in the in the juvenile, well, I don't know if juvenile justice systems, but certainly the criminal yeah. is, uh, justice systems. Again, overlapping interests, overlapping work areas that we uh, discovered. Eitan talked about Connecticut and um, they are a wonderful resource. And I, I, I bet they would be willing to come and talk uh, to uh, committees about, about the experience. But I wanted to just point out in this report, we did include um, a copy of the legislation that they passed. Uh, and, and so you can see an example of what data collection um, legislation looks like uh, after the fact, after the hard work of getting that through. That was, as I understand, a result of, of considerable support consensus across are the you, board. Um, and I just want to yeah. understand, are you both suggesting that we should introduce something similar to Connecticut's? Uh, legislation. Yes, I think Eitan, I think that was really. I think that was definitely a feeling that the panel had as a whole. Yes. I, I'm happy to, to do that. I'm sure the House members are as well. Um, Bryn, if you could make that a drafting request and anybody on the committee who wants to sign on either version. Um, I realize you, you may not be the drafter, but um, that influence and based right. on Connecticut. I, one thing that, that jumped to my mind, and since Woodside's closed, I feel free to speak about it. It would have been interesting to know um, the restraints at Woodside, which was one of the reasons problematic. Were they based upon any bias, racial bias? or were they based upon a bias against those who are significantly, seriously mentally ill? Were they not able to deal with that? What, you know, who was being restrained? Um, and, you know, that would have been interesting to know, but also to be able to deal with, with that particular population. And I, and I don't we know. Don't, I don't know that we know that. Um, I don't either. I don't and, know that you know. It would be, um, I have a sense based upon what I've heard from people at a program here in Bennington that I used to run, that the majority of the restraints are on a small number of the, of the residents. In other words, most residents don't get restrained, but some get restrained numerous times because of behavior or whatever, but I don't know. So even that little data point would be helpful to know. Uh, mm -hmm. That's basically what you're talking about. Right? And we learned through that process that, you know, DCF has mandatory reporting uh, requirements to the federal government on various points, including race data. Again, um, I'm not, I'm, I'm, de I'm definitely don't know about the specifics you're asking about. So uh, I would just, I'm just using but, that as an example of a point yeah. where we don't know you know, exactly because I don't know, but maybe they do have it, but um, those, I was using that as merely an example of places where we don't know. But how useful would it be to know? And also what we realize is how easy it is potentially to just capture that information, right? And, to, and, then, to, um, and then to be able to review it. And as Aton said, one of the, one of the key uh, suggestions here is not just what decisions and data points to collect. I'm going to go take care of the dog who's barking. Oh us. no! All right. <laughs> but but to make sure that that we get timely reporting, 
that it's not something that you work and work and work and work and, and work it up for a final report once a year. Because how, you, how much usefulness is that ultimately to all of us, whether it's, it's the policymakers and, 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 and you, the legislators, or, or the attorneys on the ground, the officers in corrections, right? All the judges to, to make real time adjustments and to correct as quickly as we can. Um, these things. So that was a that was a uh, another important recommendation in there in terms of what we're hoping is not just the the what data to collect, what is the prioritization, but who and how uh, this data will be collected and analyzed. And Aton stressed it, uh, having having whatever it is, the body, have the capacity, looking beyond what we are doing now, but looking broader because we have uh, some potential help in state, learning from Connecticut and our nearby um, neighbors, how they're doing it. Uh, we've learned that, I, and it was shocking um, how quickly they got this spot up. Right, and and it was pointed out to us that certainly, in some respects, some of that data they were they were collecting in a larger amount, and so it was easier to uh, to collect. But also, it, they weren't under perfect uh, a perfect environment there too. I think the prosecutors were getting a new uh, data system, yeah. right, database yeah. system, and so that was holding things up. But we learned that. There, they had help, or, or others have had help with sort of the preliminary um, planning, where they would uh, hire essentially a data mapping consultant to come in and quickly identify and suggest how to suggest how to do it. And then there was the um, the actual body that got created to sort of analyze it. So it was in, it was interesting. It wasn't some multi year project uh, where we could expect not until. 2030 to find the results, but it was one year Senator, later. Senator Lyons has a question. Oh, excuse me. Uh, you know, thank you. This is really uh, terrific. But what I'm hearing you say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that as people were exposed to the information that it automatically made a change in behavior. Is that um, in Connecticut? Is that accurate, inaccurate? And then I, I do have a couple, I do have a couple questions. Aton, I don't, I don't know if the Connecticut folks shared how quickly or, or what they were doing to adjust it. I know that they issued their first report in January, right? Right, but it, what they did say was it, it, it certainly got legislative responses extremely quickly. The, in terms of actual uh, changes in behaviors out in the real world, we don't know yet. Okay. But it certainly did get, it got legislative responses very quickly. And, okay. and it may be in the future, we could, we could see if, if Pepper would be willing to talk on this point. I know that the Connecticut, yeah. uh, Connecticut Prosecuting Office did a training for a national training for prosecutors that Pepper shared with us. And, right. and, and they shared the data and the conclusions that they learned and how that was impacting their management of cases, of how they were dealing with um, oh, all sorts of things, right? I mean, the decisions to, to uh, defer. Uh, you know, that's another data point. If we find out and see through this that there isn't, there aren't the numbers being uh, sent to defer, to diversion. Does that support, again, policy um, decisions in ter terms of expanding who can, uh, send folks right to to diversion again. All, the data will be the start, but it will it will be so informative in terms of how we choose to use it to then address the issue, right? And that's going to be a different set of of of. But, of but the the data itself will uh, certainly raise questions. Um, I'm looking at page 24 of the report. The yeah, it's the appendix four, and it has the current. Uh, flow state high level data flow system and you brought up the the idea of having uh, an integrated IT I think you said something about that but communication is absolutely key here um, having criteria for assessment and and how to interpret information is absolutely key so someone has to do that but then having the the linkages um, 
so so that people don't fall through the cracks, but there's some consistent um, data flow and data information. And that, for me, then it begins to suggest, I know that it's a step down the road, obviously. I think first data collection interpretation and then working with people to make some change is so important. Um, and we've seen that in, in my district in particular, because I'm in Chittenden County. But the, the, so, but then, you know, the reality hits us as legislators and the costs associated with doing some of this is, um, is there. And uh, Eitan mentioned the cost and the cost of not doing it, I think is even more significant. So does Connecticut have any sort of printout or, or indication of the initial cost to going through the data collection and then uh, what they may be doing beyond that in terms of IT, um, certainly we're smaller, might be less costly. Yeah, we got so many, the documents we got are the documents. I don't think we asked for that. I'm afraid. I'm <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I, I'd be afraid too, but that's okay. That's good. <laughs> no, but yeah, I'm we, sure they can. They'd be willing to share um, their experiences. Um, and again, again, I it's it's not to just stress uh, to overstress, but um, I think. I think that there is a lot of potential uh, supporters out there, partners in terms of this, who are already doing the data collection. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, I just learned about the National Center on Restorative Justice. So just one, but the other thing I wanted to leave, um, I wanted to, to point out, which is that yes, this is, this is gonna be hard, right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is hard, uh, but, but it, I think the uh, the the reason why is is not only worthy. I mean, we're we're trying to understand. I mean, how can we understand and fix systemic racism if we don't know how to effectively do it, but also how to efficiently do it with our resources, right? Our limited resources. If we're going to try to fix it, let's let's really have the targeted sense of where we should put those dollars or shift things if that's where the problem is. But the other thing, I I, I know it's hard, but one of the one of the things I'm left feeling after filing this report, Aton, is that um, this was a consensus report, right? It was. I'm, 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 com I'm coming from the Defender General's office, but I referenced Pepper. We, we, there, this, I mean, Judge Grierson did have one point he, um, yes. on it, on, I forget what it was, a decision making he, point. Yeah, he, he abstained on, he, for the judiciary on section three. But and ultimately, it, there is a consent, there's consensus yeah. um, across the board. And again, for what it's worth, that was also the, the case in Connecticut. And I think you have to have a consensus to get something this big um, to work, but I think we're I think, there. I think all of us understand, I hope we do that. Yeah. You first have to recognize there's a problem and then you have to fully understand the problem before you can fix it. And to me, most of us recognize there's a um, certainly a problem now, getting the data to fully understand the problem and try to fix the problem is, is the step. And I really appreciate the presentation this morning. And I don't know if there's other questions. I did want to save a little time to thank one of our committee members who's no longer going to be with us for our service on this committee over the years. Representative Hass has represented so ably, um, and I want to make sure we mention that before we adjourn our last meeting of the year and turn it over to the House members for the next year as leadership. But, um, thank you so much, Sandy, for everything you've done and your work on this committee. And thank you. It has been a great, great pleasure to work with all of you for all these years. Yes. Thank you. And I did want to make sure I said that before we break, but I know Senator Hooker, I believe, has a question. Just a quick question, um, Eitan, you mentioned that you wanted the body to be um, housed in a place that was nonpartisan. Where does the Connecticut um, body uh, sit? In, in, and where, where would you suggest? It's a, well, I'm not sure we have the same thing. They have, it is 
in the Office of Policy and Management. They are the Criminal Justice Policy and Planning right. Division. That was, I believe, under the governor's office. I think Mike Lawler used to be. I and I, I believe that's an appointment from the governor. So it is an administrative office. Mm -hmm. If I got the right office. I believe you do. <laughs> but he, he was more like the Defender General in that his survival, I don't know, depended upon the governor. That's one way to put, to make it more independent, make it like the Defender General where, um, it's for a certain amount of time. And um, speaking of which, I believe the Defender General's up for reappointment this year. So. But it's every, I think it's every five years. And so it doesn't, doesn't get that political. Butch, did you have a question, comment? No, thank, no, thank you, Senator Molson. I, I know uh, Representative Hooper just wrote a note to all of us on the chat, but to those of you who can't see the chat, I would second that. Um, and I think the entire committee um, re really thanks both of you um, for your presentation, for the hard work on this, and um, would thank you very much. And uh, it doesn't end here. Um, this is the beginning. And, right. Um, hopefully, we will see you in January. Great. Until then, uh, have a happy holiday for both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You too. Bye-bye. Committee, we made it. Two minutes to spare. Bryn and Phil, Philip, and uh, Peggy, thank you for all your help in making this happen the last two years. Um, without you, um, it would have been impossible. And uh, thank you so much for your Oh. And thank you, Mr. Chair. It's been a, a, a lot of work and we all appreciate the time that you put in to make it uh, so effective. Well, with that, um, I guess we're adjourned and say goodbye and happy holidays to everybody. Oh, oh uh, Senator? Yes, Representative. I do have Sean. something to say to the committee and, and I, I want to bring this forward before Sandy goes upon her merry way and, uh, and leaves us. Uh, since I've been on this committee, at, anyway, for many years, uh, every time this committee met, I would pick Sandy up in Rochester on my way to Montpelier. We were able to solve every problem in state government. <laughs> Maybe not the same way, but we were able to do that. And I have missed that over this last, uh, this, this fall. We haven't had our spirited discussions, uh, which always ended up friendly with many times no agreement, but I'm gonna miss that Sandy and I, I, I wish you well. Yeah. Thank you, Bush. Very helpful. Sandy, thank you. All right, I guess we're adjourned. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. See you in January. Bye now. Until January. Yes. Yeah.